With cyber attacks on the rise, protecting your data security is more important than ever. So why is Congress considering a bill that puts your credit card data at greater risk of being hacked and exposed to foreign networks? The Durbin Marshall credit card bill shifts billions in consumer spending to less secure payment networks, all so that corporate megastores can make bigger profits. Don't let Durbin Marshall steal your data. Visit electronicpaymentscoalition.org and tell your senators to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. Ronna McDaniel, former head of the RNC, apparently was hired by NBC. I don't, I don't know if she's going to keep her job or not, uh, but apparently their heads were blowing off yesterday. Uh, this is a little bit of what happened on, what, Meet the Press and then Morning Joe a bit earlier today. I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. She has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? We weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it for several re reasons. We hope NBC will reconsider its decision. <laughs> it goes without saying that she will not be a guest on Morning Joe in her capacity as a paid contributor. Gentlemen, your attention, please. Just a catching yes. strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. It's time for our main event. Welcome back to a good week here at the Ruthless Variety Program, where Sands won. Ashbrook is uh, he's doing spring break things. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he's on vacation, but that's just Ashbrook. <laughs> I mean, it feels like it's an every other week thing. We're just like violence. Guy likes, guy likes his vacation. Just violence. No, uh, Smug versus Ashbrook is is the Cold War of the variety program <laughs> right now. I love it. Every it, episode, it's a new jab. It really is. Yeah. It really is. Um, so what you heard off top was NBC's decision to make Ronna McDaniel, the former chair of the RNC, a paid contributor mm -hmm. to their program. And apparently that has ruffled all kinds of feathers. And you saw, you heard a, uh, a couple of clips, uh, Chuck Todd and everyone else, where, I mean, uh, they, have a, they have a huge problem, a credibility problem. Um, we're going to get into all of that because I think we've got a lot to say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I just want some initial react from you guys. I mean, I think... It, to me, the most striking part was seeing uh, Joe and Mika flip out about this. And it said, like, uh, the headline at the bottom of the screen was, like, the GOP in the age of Donald Trump. And I'm actually old enough to remember when Donald Trump was running in 2016. And anytime he wanted to call in, he could have just free reign on Morning Joe. And Mika would be, like, giggling like a schoolgirl <laughs> the yeah. whole way through. Yeah. These people believe in nothing. They're, they're absolute nihilist is the thing. And so they think... Oh, you know, if we take a principled stand, we're not going to allow any conservative. They have Jen Psaki. They handed her her own show like the day after she left the podium at the White House. These people believe in nothing. But also, wasn't Chuck Todd a, a Dem staffer? They he still were. is. And and Tim Tim Russer and George Stephanopoulos. Yeah, all, Stephanopoulos all, had to lie on behalf yeah. of uh, Bill Clinton when Bill Clinton was attacking women. So he's yeah. got a lot of credibility. Yeah, but you hire like a Republican, the the, the chairwoman of the RNC. No, can't do it. Well, to act like she's got nothing to provide is really something. Yeah. Really something. Anyway, we're going to get into all of that and a lot more. But we wanted to start with a special topic. Yeah. One that we've discussed on this program for months and months and months. Although we've done it, we've tried to do it respectfully. Mm -hmm. I think that we're not going to do it respectfully anymore. No, I don't think we can... We can do it respectfully. Uh, and, and the only reason why, dear listener, is I think it's an existential crisis for the Republican Party. And the people who are sitting here on this show would like to win. And in order to win, we have to tell you some hard truths about what's happening right now in, in an area that I don't think is getting a lot of coverage in conservative circles in media. Everyone's obsessed with you know, Trump trials and all of this sort of stuff. But, like, there is blocking and tackling of elections that determine the winner that we're screwing up right now. So the beauty of conservative politics is you all believe in free market policy. You all believe in capitalism and everything else. 
the downside of that is that you get a whole bunch of free market capitalists who think a good pitch makes more than a good outcome. And we've seen this for a number of years. And what I'm talking about specifically is a massive grift that's happened within the conservative movement that has had well-meaning donors and well-meaning participants in a process come to believe things that people say uh, bring them a little bit closer to victory. And, and, and basically what they do is they criticize anything that's been quote-unquote establishment. Yeah. And <clears throat> in their alternative version, everything is new, brand new, and interesting, and fun. What we need to do is play you the audio of something that we heard over the weekend. Uh, yeah, this is a video put out by Turning Point Action. Um, and just for the background for our, our listeners, Turning Point Action has been putting together a what they say is going to be a $100 million get-out-the-vote operation, the backdrop being there that Republicans have failed uh, to motivate people to vote through a variety of, of ways, and that Turning Point's going to step in and take over this process to make sure Republicans win in 2024. So let's play that clip. Democrats have expanded early vo voting mm -hmm. for one reason, one reason alone. It gives them more opportunity to chase down more ballots. Right. If you vote too early, you're basically telling Democrats how many votes they need to win. We are huge advocates for day of returning back to single day, right. holy election day promise, right? Right. Not trying to encourage more people to get on the early voting list. Right. The RNC has said that. We think that's wrong. Turning Point Action Team right now are helping people to say, okay, you're an early voter. Let's make you a day of voter. Our focus is people who don't vote. Right. So Chase the Vote is focused on let's make people who don't vote that are already registered. Let's get their ballot in and then teach them to become day, day of voters. And the reason why that's important. Right. So I need to specify one thing. All those weird jump cuts that you heard, that's not us. That's them. They put this video out. Yeah. They put this video out. Yeah, that's, they, that's like an online thing, especially like on TikTok, where any second that might have like a pause gets edited. They edit that out. That, yeah. it, it's just so weird to put out that video with 10 jump cuts and be like, yep, this is a banger. Like, so, so, <laughs> so, so hold on. Who is this dude? That's talking. Uh, I think that's the ty uh, Tyler. Tyler Boy Bo Boyer? Boyer. Boyer. I th I think so. Okay. So so what Turning Point has said is that they are going to and, and let's rewind the tape. We talked about this earlier on this year. Turning Point USA has said they're going to put together a hundred and fifty million dollar operation that deals with early vote that de deals with. Uh, registration that deals with absentee by mail absentee it also yeah. deals with uh like vote hauling right like yeah. like a full where it's legal well yeah the, the the point was i think like the democrats made these rules we gotta play their own game in order to win and that's and that's what they said that they wanted to do was that they created all these rules and so we need to go out and play by their rules in order to win Okay. All right. Yeah, I actually love that. Like, I mean, that that makes total sense. That sounds great. And then you fast forward a year. Because, I, I mean, again, I remember after 2020, there, were, there was all this talk among conservatives online of, like, we should put drop boxes outside of, like, every church, outside of every country. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yes. And, and, and I would point out that Mike Garcia and Young Kim wouldn't be Republicans in the House of Representatives, if not for the way that they did this in California, they played by the rules as the Democrats. They did wrote it so them well. The won. Dems cried about it, right? But like, re remember the fact that they went to the mat saying, "If Democrats are going to ballot harvest, we need to ballot harvest That's too." The thing. Mm -hmm. And that that was the whole. It makes sense. Fight fire with fire. That was the hey, whole Max, impetus sense. behind this operation, right? None of none of any of these people, by the way, have won so much as a dog catcher contest. In any point, mm -hmm. like they're they're entertainers. They do a a nice sort of conservative pitch in convention yeah. where they bring people and they put it together a show and there's lasers and uh, it's great. Whatever, that's terrific. None of them have actually won anything to speak of, but 
now that they have you, and I don't know how much they've raised towards their 150, but what they're talking about was if Democrats are going to ballot harvest, we're going to ballot harvest. Uh, wait. What, no. What was that? What was that? Well, so now what? What, the, what, now, what did he just say? Now what? Now what they're saying is if you vote by mail or vote early, you're letting the Democrats know how many Republicans have voted, and then that's going to be that's going to tell them how many votes they have to steal or something. I don't know. It sounds conspiratorial, but the thing that I found most upsetting about that entire video was the idea that someone would be a person who regularly votes early and you tell them, don't do that. You know, don't do that. That was to that. me the most disturbing it, it thing. It like only vote on election day. I mean, can, can, can you figure out to convert, that's can trying I, to lose. That can, is tr trying to lose an election. Lose. Can we, can we just because the jump cuts and the shitty production value of that thing was so fucking bad, I need everyone to hear it twice just to internalize the dumb fuckery that is involved in what it is that they're telling people. Yeah. Democrats have expanded early vo voting mm -hmm. for one reason and one reason alone. It gives them more opportunity to chase down more ballots. Right. If you vote too early, you're basically telling Democrats how many votes they need to win. We are huge advocates for day of returning back to single day right holy election day promise right, right. not trying to encourage more people to get on the early voting list oh right? my the rnc God. has said that we think that's wrong any point action team right now are helping people to say okay you're an early voter let's make you a day of voter our focus is people who don't vote Right. So Chase the Vote is focused on let's make people who don't vote that are already registered, let's get their ballot in and then teach them to become the yeah, voters. And the reason why that's important. Right. Hold on, hold on. I'm so fucking confused. Let's get their ballot in. Yeah. But then to teach them to be day of voter. Right. Doesn't that seem isn't that you're like gonna you're gonna convince people to vote early and then you're going to tell them, actually, that's the bad process, and now you have to be an election day voter. I mean, the rhetorical pretzels these people have to twist themselves into, rather than just having a good absentee and early vote program, it's absurd. It's, it's, it's patently absurd. And what I, what I find most absurd about it is that Turning Point Action and all these folks came up in Arizona politics, where the bread and butter of the Republican Party has been the permanent early voter list the people who vote early is how Republicans won in that state. And then Kelly Ward came in and all these dipshits, and we haven't been able to win statewide in the state ever since. I mean, let's put up put up, put up, uh, put up, up the 2016, graphic one, 2016 vote method in Arizona. Okay, so there you see early ballots. And what Arizona does is they roll up absentee by mail and, and in-person early vote. And if you look at the early ballots there— you see, Republicans won early ballots. They won by 20,000 by 20, votes. 20,000 votes. And then you know what? We have a strong election day turnout. We always do. And those two things in concert means you win the state by three and a half points. And yeah. Donald Trump is president of the United States because of programs like that. Okay, so let's flash forward to 2020. Let's put that graphic on the screen. Oh, look, we lost early ballots by 140,000 votes. Holy shit. 140,000 uh, vote deficit walking into Election Day. 140? Yeah. You go from winning it yeah. to 140,000 votes? And I don't care how good your turnout operation is for Election Day. When you have a, a hill that steep to climb, you can't get there. That's how we lost Arizona in 2020. We banked all on Election Day, and we had a great turnout on Election Day. But it's not enough if the Democrats are banking all of those votes in absentee by mail and early vote. It just doesn't fucking work. And I don't understand how people who came up in Arizona politics who've seen how this operation is supposed to work can be on there in that video talking about taking people who vote early that we have in their voter file— that that is how they vote and trying to get them to change their behavior and not bank their vote. It is patently fucking absurd. Help me understand one aspect of this, because I, 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 I'm, I'm frankly, I, I don't get it. I like I literally just don't. Well, I mean, it. that's the thing is, is what, the, to me, the most completely offensive part is saying we get people who would vote early and we tell them don't do that. Right. Just show up on Election Day. Here's the thing is. 
when someone when you get a Republican to vote early, when you have that vote in hand, it's like you know, with, with one in hand is worth two in the bush. Yeah. I mean, everyone's known this saying for time memorial. You know, you've got that vote, but you want to say no. I want to roll the dice and see if election day works for you. I don't know if your kid's going to get sick. I don't know if there's going to be a blizzard. I don't know if you're going to get into a car accident. I don't know if a nine million things that everyone what? faces on their daily lives and smug, could happen. And Smug, think about the misallocation of resources that you have somebody who's a proven early voter, and now you're going to have to turn them out for election day. So now you've changed your entire GOTV budget as a political campaign, and instead of being able to save resources, knowing this, that you have votes in the fucking at. bank— it's a lot more expensive it's, to get voters yeah. out on election so day than to get their ballot. So by instead mail. of instead of ha having to send P2P text messages to people who are election day only voters, now you have to spend even more money on election day convincing people who you should have banked their vote already and you got to turn them out on election day. Well, I think Arizona is a perfect example, right? Because they have an incredible reporting structure. Yes. In which by the end of I don't think it's is it every week or is it every day? Of in person, it's every day. You, so it's you, every day. From so, the Secretary of State's so office. So if a ballot gets returned, you're a registered voter in the state of Arizona. If a ballot gets returned, you know the registration of the participant. Right. And you actually see whether or not it is in the bank or not in the bank. And so it, it takes the subjectivity out of what you're marketing to try to get people out. The GOTV budget, as we call it, it's called get out the vote, budget shrinks. Yeah. Based upon who it is that you know that's already voted. So it, it, I don't know. I mean, you don't have to be fucking Einstein to figure out if your people have already voted in a certain segment, you don't need to actually advertise to those people. Right. You save you a lot need, of money. You can save a lot of money. You can figure out how to winnow the field and figure out how to suppress your advertising budget right to the point where it matters, where you're getting straight down to people low who are election day, yeah. low propensity voters. And, and these guys are saying, no, 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 no. Let's make things a lot harder. What we'd like to do. Is a Rube Goldberg experiment. Is in <laughs> an election that we're being outspent six to fucking one. I'd like to figure out how to spend all of our money maintaining what we all have already had, just paying for it all. Yeah. Push it all to election day. Not trying to do. The persuasion element. And he was talking about voters that don't vote at all. Voters don't vote at all. Wouldn't it be nice to focus on voters that don't vote at all? It would be great. You know when you can do that? After you get the when you permanent bank. absentee. Yeah. Your, your After your mail -in you votes? get your all, all votes already in. <laughs> right. Like, dude, this is what we've been talking about all the whole time with these people. They have no fucking idea what it is that they're talking about. There's no idea how to win an actual election. The only way that you get to the point where you're turning out voters that don't vote at all is when you've already voted with your 505, 405 three of five Republican voters. And the it, thing is, you learn all of this the first, and for sure by the second campaign you work on. Well, you, I, can, I, like, I mean, it, like, you can be the most junior dude, junior person on the totem pole. You can be the intern, or, you know, interns do God-tier work. Managing the volunteers, taking care of them, making sure the phones are ringing, that's great stuff. But you learn these kind of basics of blocking and tackling on, like, the first or second campaign that you work. So these are basics. These are I, fundamentals. If you're listening to this right now, and I, I don't blame you if this is you, I totally understand it. And you're wondering, like, why are the guys, like, so hot on this thing? You know, maybe you've never worked on a political campaign. But, like, this is the equivalent of, like, you know, the discovery of the wheel. And the wheel, <laughs> the wheel works, and the wheel has always worked, and the wheel gets you places. And then people coming along and being like, those people selling the wheel are wrong. <laughs> the wheel should be triangles. The triangles will get us there faster. It's just like that is the basic level of ig ignorance here in this entire thing, and that's why we're so hot is because this isn't just like, look, I don't have a fucking thing to sell. I'm telling you, don't fund that. Don't I'm telling that. I'm telling you if you are like a conservative billionaire and like you're giving this money, I hope your 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 kids baker act your ass <laughs> and put you in a fucking home and put your estate in a conservatorship. I'm I'm telling you what you just said makes it if you if you find your grandparents or parents funding an operation like that, you should put their estate into a conservatorship. Yeah. Cuz that is like the decision-making process that leads you to ruin. 
Like, I don't understand for the life of me how anyone can come to the conclusion that that is what you're buying. Yeah. If you want to win an election, that is precisely what you do not buy. Precisely what you do not buy. That is the reason we are in the situation that we're in. Do you ever, like, sit back and wonder how it is that you won, like, I don't know, four or six presidential elections in a row? How you had massive majorities or like in 2014 how like republican party politics figured itself out and was like emergent in 2016 mm -hmm. with the rise of donald trump and how it is lost in 2018 2020 2022 2023 and now we're entering in 2024 does that ever occur to anybody does it does anybody think about that well that's the thing is so with things like uh, permanent absentee lists, mm -hmm. I remember that was that was something I was always extremely competent at, always laser focused on because of the importance of. But the thing is, is that permanent absentee list going after early voters, chasing ballots, it's not sexy because there's there's no money in it. There's no money to be made in there because it's like okay, well we're gonna put the list of permanent absentee voters on the phones. The volunteers are gonna call them and be like, hey, have you put the ballot in the mail yet? Yeah. Of course. There's no money to be made there. But if you can be like, I've got the secret sauce, and mm. it's the exact opposite of what you think. I'm the only truth teller out here. There's a fortune to be made. Yeah. I've got the triangle. I think that is— <laughs> That's it. I've I got think the that, triangle. I You've tried the wheel. I have the secret triangle. That's a disgusting reality. That's the thing. Is <laughs> you'll be like, I'm the only one. You'd think it's stupid, but that's the reason why <laughs> no one's tried it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we talk about the psychology of this? Like, he said at one point, we're, we're encouraging people not— to early register. Yeah. Because then Democrats know how many ballots yeah. you need to win. So what is it about that uh, logic that makes you, like if you if you think the entire thing was going to be rigged, what makes election day voting sacrosanct? That's the thing. You know, like it, it if, you, no if, really, if you really believe that the entire thing is, is going to be rigged soup to nuts, but it's not going to be on election day, on election day, it's like, it's all good. Everything else is absolutely rigged. Not to mention the fact that like you can seal that absentee by mail uh, ballot and you can track it online all the way through processing and to vote counting. No, that's going to be rigged. Too. No, you got to show up on election day and then it's going to be perfect. It doesn't fucking work, dude. I just showed you the numbers. 2020, we got boat raced. We got fucking <laughs> boat raced in early vote and absentee by mail. And that's how we lost Arizona. And we'll lose it again if people don't go back to the bread and butter of the Republican Party. I'm going to go blue in the fucking face talking about this, but it's true. And I know people don't want to hear it. And people don't want to hear all the yelling and screaming about what's wrong with the Republican Party. I get it. You watch this or you listen to this because you want to be entertained. But like there are some truths that need to be told. And if they're not told, then we're going to be sweep, sleepwalking to losing again in November. It and just like, is let's reality. Just say, like the reason you listen to Ruthless is we're going to tell you because we don't have a fucking horse in the race. We got nothing to sell you on it. Go donate to the campaigns you want to win. Go do whatever you <laughs> yeah. want to do. But there's no one else that's going to actually tell you. We've been practitioners in the field for 20 years. I mean, the, we've it, known it. We know how this works. The, the important thing is like, I mean, Duncan breaks down the data. You see it right there on the screen in front of you. It's like the reason... President Trump got elected in 2016 is because they had that operation in Arizona, and now it's getting to the point that Georgia's a swing state. Like, at some point, if you're fed up with it, it's time to, like, get back to basics, block and tackle, and yeah, you, just win the election. You don't even need to look at the numbers necessarily. Just look at what's happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> just look. Let me give you last one last stat. Yes. Because it's not Arizona specific. It's all of these states. Any state that allows mail-in or early ballot mm -hmm. has got the same situation going. So in, in Nevada, a state that we're familiar with in 2022, um, a total turnout of 54.7%, despite the fact that there is a 100% universal mail-out ballot available. So this is every single voter in the state that's registered gets a ballot yep. sent to their house. 100%. Like, oh, well, that's interesting. So the total turnout was 54.7%. I mean, it's just over half of those people actually figured it out. Election day, 21%. Mm -hmm. Early, 27.8%, so 28%. Male, 51%. Yeah. Anybody want to know, like, you gathered a guess for 
any extended period of time what it was that the mail looked like at the end? Well, it was a roughly 70,000 vote margin for Democrats. Yeah. 70,000. Yeah, so if you don't uh, find a way to get people to vote by mail as a Republican, you're giving up a 30% turnout advantage through that vote method. And we've talked about this before, but you know what happened in Nevada, northern Nevada, on Election Day in 2022? Snowstorm. A fucking snowstorm. How do you think that helps? With your, oh, no, I can't. Let's make sure they only vote on Election Day. Yeah. Let's make sure. I want to turn early voters into Election Day voters. Terrific. A ballot that would have arrived a month ago and counted from northern Nevada. So now daycare is canceled. School is canceled. Work is tenable. And you've got to figure out how to vote in like a, you know, maybe one of two windows of your day. And with through like, a snowstorm. Through with, a snowstorm. With kids. I mean, a I lot mean, of I, people are going to say someone else is going to vote. I mean, let's be honest. Here. You know, if you're in a situation, the kids are home from school, there's a snowstorm outside, you don't want to risk driving through that, you're going to be like, you know what, someone else will vote. I just think we have to operate in the world as it exists. I mean, I, I, I like think— Like, you're being too kind. You're you know? being too kind. You're no. being too kind. What you're, what you're saying is, though, that they're, they, <clears throat> you're giving them the benefit of the doubt by saying— what they're doing here is giving you our preferential way of voting. Right. That's not what they're doing. That's not what they're doing. But I, what I'm saying is for the listener's sake, like I get it as a listener that you could think, well, shit, I have voted on Election Day every other election. Why isn't that the way the world can work? And it, that'd be great if that's the way the world worked. But why cut off your nose to spite your face? It's like the world exists as it is, and there's absentee by mail, there's early voting, and if we lose those, then we lose. We just lose. Let me just say this concisely in my point of view. If you are really into this, and you actually believe, as I believe, that the future of our country rests upon its voters on a biannual basis, and that we are not too far away from losing our country altogether mm -hmm. because of the insanity of our political process right now. If you believe that, you need to not trust hucksters and fucking idiots mm -hmm. who have never done anything. I mean, literally nothing to put a vote in the box and send your money and send your effort and send your volunteers and send your emotions to try to empower people like this who claim to have a conservative turnout operation that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. This does not exist. It does not exist. Like get in, get involved in your local party. I understand that those are fucked up too. <laughs> I understand that. Like I get it. But the reason they're fucked up is because maybe you sent, like, your money to this organization that's telling a whole bunch of people to stop voting. <laughs> Bro, you know don't I mean? vote. Like what are you doing? Like it turns Why not roll the dice and see what's happening Dude, on like, election? Like, what? Are you kidding? They're, his, their rationale is, like, don't, don't let them know that you're registered to vote because then they'll find out how many votes. All right, so you show up at, like, you know, they're, if they're you like, show up at have, 5 p.m.? Uh, they're spending $150 yeah. million dollars to send out people to your mailbox so if we think you're dropping off the ballot be like no bro this is a bad <laughs> yeah. idea no we don't want to get this on the scoreboard yeah why don't we roll like, the you, dice on election yeah, you have to vote. i want to see where things are going <laughs> unless unless you wait to the last 30 minutes that polls are open you are a cuck rhino yeah only true conservatives vote in the last 30 minute window so that no one knows how many votes there are but you're if in, i if, mean like this is where you we remain, are if you remain in line to vote they'll know how many votes <laughs> they gotta steal so, unless like, you were in danger leave <laughs> unless you were in danger of being caught off at the voting line on election day Cuck. Yeah. Cuck. Cuck. Hey, uh, Wolf, can you get me more bourbon? I'm getting so fucking depressed by this whole thing. I just, dude, the reason you listen to Ruthless is because we are the only ones that give you this. Nobody else does. I'll tell you what. If, if Jeff Yass, if you're listening and you don't, <laughs> if you don't send me the TikTok money, 
I'm going to start selling the triangle wheel, bro. <laughs> the triangle wheel. I'm going to be like, why Thanks, dude. risk voting? <laughs> the triangle wheel. <laughs> you know, it turns out don't vote because it won't count anyway. <laughs> it was not an awesome closing message in Georgia in yeah. 2020. And I'm guessing it probably isn't going to work for us in 2024. Anyway, wrap your head around some serious stuff. If you're going to contribute to get out the vote operations, do some homework. Do some homework. Make sure these are people who have done it before. Anyway, coming up on Ruthless, uh, we're, we got to talk a little bit about Hack Madness. That's right. Buddy. We do. We do. So, I mean, we've got over 100,000 people have already voted oh. in Hack Madness this year. Uh, I've got it pinned to my Twitter profile at Comfortably Smug. Folks, go out there and vote. I mean, this is vicious. So we've already had journalists. Have you seen the journalist journal tweets? Journals oh, are mad. so good. Yeah, they're mad. Journals are like, I'm not a hack. I reported <laughs> on that <Nancy Blue." laughs> That's the best. It literally is the best part of it. The best. Okay. Philip Bump untagged himself oh. from the tweet. He and here's did. the funny thing. Here's the funny thing is, so he hasn't tweeted since. It's a one. So seat, it like bro. hurt his feelings, bro. But it's like, a it's a one seat. Yeah, he, he it hurt his feelings. I and the thing is that me. like if you like if someone said that you know the sky is purple, you don't care. But if someone tells you something that's true, you don't want to hear. It hurts your feelings. And mm. and the dude detagged himself <laughs> and hasn't tweeted since. I mean, how much do you get? Do you get a lot of that? Oh, dude, the amount because it's all that anger. It, remember, and if sadness. you want to vote, you got to get on Twitter and you got to go to Comfortably Smug. Uh, and he posts all the polls. And yeah. You vote right there. When, when this this is we're airing uh, Tuesday morning. Is the first round done? The with? first round is ending. Yeah. There's a lot of close matches. It, uh, like the voting continues because this is a turning. This is this is hack madness. Yeah. But the amount of angry journos and journo tears. I mean, that's why this is the greatest tradition of all. Oh God, it's so good. I love every minute of it. So we're going to pick back up on the NBC thing with Rana because I think that's just like fun. Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, it's very fun. It's just fun. We got to talk about that. Uh, the Trump cases, you heard <laughs> – one thing I observed on the way into the studio is, you know, there's a ruling on the Trump cases that uh, – where he didn't have to pay the whole 450 he had to pay 150 or whatever. And like it, it, CNN, this is wall-to-wall. -wall. Yeah. They've like, lost their like never mind the fact that like you got a Russia situation with uh, this terrorist attack and everything else. Yeah, like a whole bunch of global news going on. This is the only thing that they're caring about. But we're going to give you a little update from that uh, standpoint. And then we've got a ton of awesome variety today. Yeah, I mean, really good stuff, including some from your home state, which should I'm be not, good. I'm not sure you're going to love. Should be good. Oh, I love it. We'll get to all of that. Right after this. Americans for Prosperity has done it again. You're going to love this. Know how Biden's been running around the country bragging about Bidenomics? And the media's doing stories on how the president has embraced the term? Well, guess what? Americans for Prosperity just bought the Bidenomics.com domain name. I can't believe the White House didn't get this first. This would be like Pepsi buying Coca-Cola.com. It's hilarious. Bidenomics.com sets the record straight on the failures of Joe Biden's economy, his horrible record on cost of living, wages, debt, deficits, energy, and more. I've been to the site. I can tell you, it's not what Joe Biden wants Americans to see. AFP takes Biden's own words and compares them to the reality of everyday Americans. It's packed with facts and stories that prove Bidenomics is a costly failure. Americans for Prosperity deserves a lot, a lot of credit for this coup. Visit Bidenomics.com soon, the website Joe Biden doesn't want you to see. All right. So coming back with the NBC situation. Um, so Politico has a headline, The Elephant in the Room, NBC's McDaniel hiring sparks on-air criticism from what of its own. And what they're picking up on was Chuck Todd in particular. But apparently this runs deep within the MSNBC orbit mm -hmm. of people concerned about the fact that they've hired Ronna McDaniel to be an analyst. I mean, here's the thing. Is, if we're being completely honest, it's they have an issue with the Republican being hired. And this is the thing that we've seen since since the beginning of time is that the media, before it was quiet, where they were like, we don't want to hire Republicans. We don't want to allow any kind of uh, Republican have a voice in major publications. You've seen 
uh, conservatives get driven out of like the New York Times, Barry Weiss. Like there's yeah. many famous examples. <clears throat> Tom Cotton writes an op-ed about sending the troops during the, the summer of 2020 riots and like heads rolled at the New York Times for allowing him to, to be able to say that. And then now we have the governor of New York sending the National Guard into the subways <laughs> to search people's purses because that's the problem. But anyways, they just do not want a conservative to have a voice. This is it could be Ron McDaniel, it could be any conservative. They think it should be like this is an existential threat. People will die. that's why they've like created this whole thing of this is harmful. Yeah. Because there's no real <laughs> harm being committed. They want you to connect it to like people could die. There's no harm here. Yeah. Like it's ridiculous. I, that's the, what this is. The the evolution of it, Smug, and I'm so glad you gave the history there of 2020 and Tom Cotton, the op-ed in the New York Times. The evolution is I think is absolutely fascinating. I think like by omission, they kept Republicans mm -hmm. out of these organizations for the longest time. But in 2020, yeah. we started to see this like uprising of the Slack channel. The junior employees were taking the inmates were running the asylum, yep. right? And a lot of these liberal publications. But now we have uh, like a, a like a public gatekeeping yep. of media as an institution at places like MSNBC. I mean, think about the fact smug that your mere presence on CNN a month ago led to broad consternations from within CNN, enough that they put it in their newsletter. Did they really? To, oh, to, yeah. to, to bad talk Dana for for Which having, having stay us- Stay mad, stay mad. Stay mad. <laughs> I love you. Stay, <laughs> stay mad. Till, stay, it's like you always say, stay mad in the face of our success. That's it. Now, uh, but like, I think that is like uh, an evolution of the yeah. entire thing, that now like you have on-air personalities shit talking their own organization it feels like it's a real escalation but that's the thing is like this is a public struggle session because chuck todd knows that like the kids in the slack channel will fucking kill him yeah. if he doesn't like publicly bow down no and i say, mean he's he's like building chits from within totally let's give clip two just to give you a little sense of what we're talking about here the elephant in the room yeah i think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because i don't know what to believe she is now a paid contributor <laughs> by NBC News. Well, I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? What, once at the RNC, she did say that, hey, I'm speaking for the party. I get that, that's part of the job. So, what about here? I, I will say this. I think your interview uh, did a good job of exposing, I think, many of the contradictions. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. Okay. <laughs> they act like they just hired Attila the Hun. And yeah, the funny I mean, thing is, he, he's like, I think our bosses should apologize you for putting you in that dangerous position. Get oh, the so, fuck out of here, bro. So dangerous. I mean, you, you're doing an interview. Like, doing their job is the most, <laughs> the greatest threat a journal faces imagine, on a daily basis. Imagine a national network television audience being subjected to the hiring of a serious operative on one side or the other i mean i don't know what they would do with themselves can we put up graphic three real quick oh whoa uh, i think that's jen Saki. oh my talking god to chuck todd and then like a month later the co-workers oh that's crazy <laughs> oh, i can't i did you guys remember him i want to apologize that? on behalf of embassy bosses for forcing chuck todd in this dangerous situation like, <laughs> that's the thing is that like this is all such bullshit. This is all just like they the, the like covert of like we don't hire conservatives has now become overt because of the struggle session. The young people will come after them in Slack if they're not overt of like, I want to apologize to all the kids in Slack for allowing this person on the air. I know if I don't do this, you're all going to call me a boomer and try to get me fired. Like this is absolutely sad. It's pathetic. It's Dude, if you're sad. a serious person going out there like this and letting those Zoomers bully you into this shit? Well, look, pathetic. On, honestly, Smug, there was a time when I, God, I feel like a million years old when I say stuff like this, but there was a time when we started where you knew like everything skewed left. And that was fine. But in the host's point of view and in the producer's point of view and the executive's point of view, 
uh, they were going to ask you some tough questions, but they ultimately trusted their audience. They trusted their audience to give their verdict ultimately on what the content of the interview might be. Didn't matter if it was Dick Cheney or George W. Bush or Chuck Grassley or, you know, whomever. I mean, it was it was incumbent upon the audience to hear the questions and the answers and make a verdict about whether they thought the questions were unfair or whether the interviewer responded or whether they were, I mean, it was, it was like part of the process was just providing the audience. Mm -hmm. It was, it was actually just, it was about the audience. Now it's not about the audience. And I think part of that is because legacy media has lost a significant amount of their credibility and audience. And so their decision at that point is not how do we regain credibility to regain audience. Their point is, how can we have such strict control on what this audience is served so so they're completely dependent on us and we can scare them that if you listen to anyone other than us in our viewpoint, it's dangerous. Which is amazing, but it's a perfect segue. That's what, that's what they're thinking. Perfect segue to clip three. Spagats, if we can line up clip three here, I think that illustrates his point perfectly. Daniel. Well, uh, she was on Sunday's Meet the Press. It was her first appearance since the NBC and since NBC News hired her as a political analyst. Uh, I know you won't be surprised to know that we've been inundated with calls this weekend, as have uh, uh, most people connected with this network, about NBC's decision to hire her. Uh, we learned about the hiring when we read about it in the press on Friday. Uh, we weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it. Oh, <laughs> Bro, but so what would you have peeps? done? What would you have done? That's the thing is like, <laughs> what would you have done, Joe? Here's the thing is, Joe, if you had any pull, if you had any pull, you could stop them right now, dude. <laughs> yeah. But the point is the same people who day in and day out had this fun little struggle session with Donald Trump where they talked about all the things with the, wrong with the Mika Republican Party. Mika was giggling, party. dude, the whole way through. And it was, he, Trump was like patting her on the head. And they were de like the, the only thing they lived for was the day-to-day -day Donald Trump call in in 2016. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, politics have changed on that, yeah. guys. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now Ronna McDaniel, who was in charge of running a political party that they object to, oh my gosh, if they'd asked our opinion. If they'd only <laughs> asked our opinion. That's also funny he admits that. He's like, so here's oh. the thing is, no one here gives a shit what I think, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude. Morning, Joe. That should have been the Cairo the on the TV. Morning, Joe. No one gives a shit what I think here. Well, quite obviously. I mean, listen. Sounds like they got a good point. I'll give the executives <laughs> great credit in this yeah. regard. That's right. Yeah. They have actually. Shout out to the execs. <laughs> Shout out to the execs in not consulting Joe and Mika on your hiring decisions of a Republican. Also, like, I mean, it just, I can't get over morning Joe's like, I walk around the offices of NBC and everyone better ask me my opinion on shit or oh. not make a move with a, He's like, morning Joe was not consulted, bro. I mean, <laughs> what's so funny about this? So, uh, they're going to say, we hire Republicans. Like, we hire Republicans, we try to provide a balanced point of view. Okay, all right. So who, well, like, what Republicans do you hire? And they're like, well, we've hired a former RNC chairperson himself. Oh, Michael Steele, right? Is Michael it? Steele. Sure. Oh, okay, all right. So there's precedent in that. Well, what's the difference between uh, McDaniel and Michael Steele? Well, I don't know. I, like, how, what they, how do they vote in 2020? Michael Steele endorsed Joe Biden yeah. mm. in October of 2020. Yeah. Think about that. for That's the Republican? Mm -hmm. That's the Republican? That's the thing. It's this the is the only, person that the, they put up. The only voices they want allowed is what they can control and push to their audience of like, yes, only, only we can provide you with this information. You shouldn't listen to outside voices. Trust in us. Trust in Joe Biden. Just don't listen to anyone else. Like, that's the thing is, what do they think is so dangerous about hearing something from someone that disagrees? With? Well, I, I, I think— Like, <clears throat> that's a problem. 
I think it goes to a, a broader point, and that is like legacy media, corporate media only accept a Republican that's been totally cowed. Yeah. Like, well, look at look at look at all the contributors yeah. to like Washington Post, New York Times, CBS yeah. Jen News, Jen Rubin's the like ABC Republican News, writer for Washington NBC Post, like, News, all the legacy organizations. Just look at the Republican side, and then you make a decision whether or not you think that like if if. 10 to 15 percent of those people actually voted for Donald Trump, I'd be blown away. Yeah. yeah. Well, blown I, away. It's it's why I think on this show we've had such like like a criticism of the never Trump movement is I think like the media exposes it for what it is in so many ways. And if you want to disagree with Donald Trump, I have no problem with that at all. But in the context of the media, it exposes itself as just a grift where Republicans just uh, use the political capital that they had being Republicans and turncoat on everything we've believed in our entire lives in order to get a contract at a place like MSNBC. And that is really the rub. Like, like that's the only sort of Republican they'll accept is somebody who will go into that struggle session smug and say, I give up all the beliefs I pretended to have for my entire career. I will go on your station every night and talk about how Republicans are wrong. That's it. That's it. And that's the way that they operate, which is incredible that we're in a situation where they actually are doing this out loud. They're doing it out loud. Yep. They're telling us, like, you know what? 50, at this point, like 54% of the American public, we don't need to hear. No, from write them off. Write them off completely. Need, we don't need to hear from you. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Oh, Jesus. Anyway. The whole thing has been absolutely hysterical from my perspective because it is yet another example of how they're unmasking themselves. Completely. Mm -hmm. The media is great at distracting you from things you should actually be focused on. While the media was debating Taylor Swift, China, Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa, basically half the world's population created BRICS. That's B-R-I-C-S, which is a massive economic alliance that's already talking about replacing the dollar with their own currency. The consequences of this could be dire, with your 401k accounts losing value if BRICS is successful. Why risk your personal savings? Diversify your financial future. Invest in the one thing that has proven stable for centuries, gold. From today's sponsor, Allegiance Gold. They've earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry, and their relationships are based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. Go to protectwithruthless.com today or call 855-510-GOLD. Right now, get up to 5000 in free silver with a qualifying purchase. Don't rely on promises of ever-increasing stock values or assurances the economy will remain stable forever. Protect your financial future today. Protectwithruthless.com. That's protectwithruthless.com or call 855-510-GOLD. All right, so let's get the Trump thing. The Trump thing is very interesting. Recall a $454 million judgment against him last month. Uh, the bond was slashed uh, by more than half in an appeals court ruling yesterday. Uh, an appeals court, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the source on this, but I know it to be true, so you can count on us for this. Uh, source, trust me, bro. Yeah, you just trust. AP, AP's just got trust. this. And uh, Wall Street Journal, everyone's got this. Must pay $175 million within the next 10 days. Now, that may sound like an absolutely ridiculous uh, judgment in and of itself, but compared to $464 million that he owed yesterday, um, it's a pretty good deal for him. Yeah. And what it means is that he can actually put that bond forward and actually appeal the hearing in the hopes of overturning it and not have to pay the whole summary judgment. And so to me, this is interesting for a number of reasons. First off, <clears throat> this is the, the the original amount was more than the cost of the Louisiana purchase. It's more than Bernie Madoff, who ran the greatest Ponzi scheme of all time, robbing from people, was charged. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, who all the banks he borrowed from agreed with his valuations and he paid back every penny. And they said in, in documentation that was submitted to the court 
The bank said they want to do more business with Trump after this. He paid us back. We were completely cool with this. We have no issue. The craziest part of this is they're like, well, he uh, uh, decided the amounts on his properties. They were fraudulent. They're not worth that much. And then when the time comes for them to try to take $450 million from him, they wanted to take those properties because they're like, that can clear – 450 easily. Yeah. An example, like the New York Times itself puts out this like notification I got this morning where it was like, Donald Trump must pay 454 million. Can they but experts say, well, they're like, experts say uh, assigning value to his properties is almost impossible. Oh, is it? Because I thought that's what <laughs> that's we did the, the whole court case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, Fannie Willis and the judge said that Mar-a-Lago is worth 18 million. And again, I don't care what you think about Donald Trump. Yeah, I don't care if you're going to vote for Donald Trump. What we're talking about is the most ridiculous thing of all time. It's just on insanity. one hand, you have a court definitively saying that he's overvalued his estate, and the other, you've got a mainstream media and everybody else being like, "I don't know, it's worth a lot, but we can't possibly." Yeah, we can't possibly come to a conclusion. But, but, but what they're one hundred percent sure of is that four hundred and sixty-four million dollars is the correct amount of punishment. (laughs) I mean, think about how absurd that is. And I've watched so much of the coverage of this. And what shocked me in it is the glee with which the liberal commentators enjoy talking about it, knowing it's, it's bullshit. Like yeah. knowing that that amount of money well, is an thing. insane thing, and and they relish the fact that they're able to pub, like punish their political opponent because that's the thing in is, a way that is that is it. disproportionate. Their, their party is united by a single ideology, and you're wondering why is it that you see these protesters that say like you know queers for Palestine or whatever? Their party has no belief system other than uniting to punish our enemies using the government's authority. That's yeah. they're like we vote like the reason Letitia James. Won the elections because she said, point blank, I will use this office to go after Donald Trump. Like they can't actually yeah. defend it on its merits, like nope. this this punishment at all, 100%. They cannot do that, but they enjoy it so much that they don't care. And that's the thing I think everybody should be very nervous about, that like that is law in this country right now. And I've been, like as, as a person on this podcast, go back and check the receipts. I've been very critical of Donald Trump in a number of issues with these court cases and everything. But this one, I feel like is pretty cut and dry, that they have they went way, way, way too far. Well, and look, I think we've been, you and I at least have been united on one point, which is like, why do we have to deal with all this shit? Yeah. Like, what, what, why are we dealing with, as a, like, you, you believe in a right of center country or you don't, and what makes it easier to make a right of center country and this has always made it harder but this is a real thing like that's happening in our country and like there's no question this new york thing is completely insane it's insanity it's complete insane and insane. the thing is that this is the model that the, the, the democrats always see what they can use and they never quit using it yeah. like this is going forward any republican that they can sue and try to take every penny from for having the gall of disagreeing with them, they will do it. They want to do it. And they, that's the thing. That's, Duncan's like, they relish They love it, dude. That's all they want is to have someone tell them, I will punish your enemies using the force of government if you vote for me, because that's all they've ever wanted. These are totalitarians. And these are the people that call us fascists. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Amazing deal. Well, I mean, just to keep with that, if you want to transition back to the other state case, which, by the way, the best thing that Trump's got going for him is the fact that these two state cases are going on. Like the New York situation, everybody can see through as a complete catastrophe. The Georgia situation with Fannie? Yeah. Holy smokes. You know what I mean? If that colors all of his legal liability, most people are going to come to the conclusion that, like, all right, there's nothing to see here. These people are absolute clowns. Let's hear from Fannie in clip four. All while that was going on, we were writing responsive briefs. We were still doing the case in the way that it needed to be done. Um, I don't feel like we've been slowed down at all. Um, I do think that there are efforts to slow down this train, but the train is coming. Oh, the train is coming. Unclear if whether that had to do with the lead prosecutor or Donald (laughs) Trump. (laughs) My Lord. 
no re- I can't believe it. Thank you. It. Nobody. <laughs> no, I, I, I heard you loud and clear, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, look, w- w- with Letitia James in New York, she has laid bare how political that prosecution was by the fact that she was tweeting out every single day, like the amount of interest owed by Donald Trump and yeah. the judgment in that case. And it feels like she's in competition with Fannie Willis to be as political as possible. And, you know, if you you went back uh, four or five months to all the polling on this issue, like if Donald Trump's convicted X, Y, and Z on these cases and all this sort of things, you saw like a big drop off of Donald Trump's vote share if he was convicted in in these cases. And what we've seen now through the prosecution of the New York case and, and this Georgia case is how those numbers have sh- shrunk. Because well, they have the, to because you're watching yeah. on live on TV. Yeah, they're like, their own worst is, enemy. This lady, this lady is literally determining whether or not your presidential nominee is a capable nominee or a criminal defendant. Mm-hmm. And like you look at that and you're like, ah. I'm going to take his word for it. That's right. the thing is, is you know, these cases initially, like Duncan said, the early polling was, you know, independent voters were like, oh, if he's convicted of anything, I'm off. Things are changing. So uh, Decision Desk had a poll that's an aggregate of polls across the country for the first time. And they're tracking Donald Trump now has a positive and that positive approval among voters. Yeah, because they're seeing the absurdity of this, like. The Democrats, yes, they want to use the state's power to punish their enemies, but they find the biggest idiots they have to try to pull it off. Now, the other side of this coin uh, is that on the same day, yesterday, Trump was also given a trial date to deal with the hush money case in New York. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 on April 15th, which, as you recall, when he had Andrew McCarthy on the program, he said, this case is completely ridiculous. Feds threw it out and they wouldn't deal with it. State picked it up. They tried to resurrect it. They ultimately filed charges. And then we said, well, it's so ridiculous. Like, is there any chance that it actually goes anywhere? He's like, oh, yeah, I think they're probably going to be a conviction. Yeah. And I mean, therein lies the goal here for Democrats. Like, it's not about putting Donald Trump behind bars or any of that sort of stuff. I think ultimately their goal in all of this is to be able to, and I've said this previously on the show, is like they just want to be able to run the ad. Yeah. The ad that says convicted felon Donald Trump. And by hook or by crook, they're going to get one of these trials through to conviction in order to do that. Well, this one, so this one, unlike everything else we've been talking about here, has, well, it's going to mm-hmm. come to some kind of a conclusion before Election Day. Right. Right. I mean, everything the fed, federal issue, the Jack Smith stuff, it, it's hooked to the presidential immunity case in the Supreme Court, likely not to be any time before June. Uh, then you get into a gray area about whether DOJ can even proceed. And like the most serious cases against Donald Trump are, are more than likely going to be pushed post-election. This is probably the one opportunity the Democrats have, right? Uh, here's the thing is, I think what's really happened in the minds of a lot of voters is once they see the absurdity of these cases that have happened so far, they've seen how ridiculous in your cases, they've seen what a circus Fannie Willis uh, turned the case in yeah. Georgia into. I think it's all melded into one big joke in their heads of they're like, well, this is just like absolute political dumb bullshit. Like, well, I, there's I th- zero mm-hmm. merit in any of it. I think it depends, Smug, like hush money case in New York. Or this circus in Georgia with Fannie Willis is one thing. Uh, but if they get into the Jan 6 case or the Mar-a-Lago docs case, which I agree, Holmes, like the timeline is not looking super good for them to actually be able to get to trial here. But they are hearing that Im- immunity claim in April before the United States Supreme Court. And I do expect them to rule against Donald Trump in that case. And you could see a scenario where they do get to that federal Jan 6 case or something over the summer, perhaps, maybe not. But I only say that to say the toughest thing with with Donald Trump is he's his own worst enemy in all these things. And if it's in the news and they're trying to push for it, even if it doesn't go to trial, 
if Donald Trump tries to make this election a referendum on Jan 6 and all of those sorts of things, it's a loser. It's a losing message. Yeah. And I hope his campaign realizes that. Oh, they do. And and that's like the, the I think that's the other thing that's sort of out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I will also say this to my people who I, look, have got a variety of opinions on Donald Trump. Are conservatives to their core and hate Joe Biden. Um, what we think is totally unprecedented at the moment, uh, but may suit your, you know, sort of predilections as a voter, uh, ultimately are something that Democrats build upon. And what I'll say is like, you remember uh, Mitt Romney's binders full of women? Yeah. Well, that was how they ran three straight election cycles, as trying to brand men with daughters, women, uh, all kinds of Republican candidates as somehow insufficiently committed to the rights of women across this country, as somehow a downstream effect from a binders full of women, which, of course, in retrospect, is hilarious, given Mitt Romney is like half a Democrat at this point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. What you're dealing with with Donald Trump, it may not be your cup of tea. You may not have voted for him in the primary. You may not ultimately get there in the general. I hope you do. But what is happening here is something that will be re replicated. Yep on any Republican that ever has the capacity of reaching the White House. It just is. This is the game plan. It just is. And, like, take it from a guy who's been in the inside for a long time. I'm just telling you, you may think that this is like a one-off, weird eight-year period of time where we're dealing with some weird stuff that we'll never we deal with again, and you've got a guy who's just not – you can't fit a category. Yeah. But you can't put the genie back in the bottle but with the Democrats. But ultimately ever. what they're doing here is something they're going to try to do throughout mm -hmm. with any Republican that's ever coming after him, period. And you already saw it a little bit in the primary when people were like – remember when Ron DeSantis made the run and people thought that there was a chance that he could beat Donald Trump and they were like – DeSantis worse than Trump? Yeah, yeah, they already started with that. Remember that? Yeah. So, it, so, like, that should give you an indication of why it is that there are certain places that you ought to put a marker down. Yeah. And I don't care if this guy is your cup of tea or not, but you ought to know when somebody's using, like, the lawfare thing is real. Yep. It's real, and it's happening. The New York and Georgia case are perfect examples of that. I don't know because I don't. I haven't seen any of the evidence, and I don't know how that case plays out on the Fed side when it deals with, <clears throat> in particular, the documents case is what I'm talking about. I think that the Jan 6 stuff is political in and of itself. But those state cases, that's a perfect example of just like you're weaponizing law to try to, if Donald Trump was not running for president, does anybody really think that he'd be facing charges? Nope. No. Nope. Of course not. No. Like, of course not. But he is, and that should concern you a lot. And they and they would do it to to everybody. And and just to tie it back to our earlier story on on MSNBC, it doesn't matter if MSNBC hires Ron and McDaniel yeah. or. Steve Bannon, they would have the exact same reaction. Yep. yep. And that's the thing that you're get, you're alluding to there is like, it doesn't matter if it was Donald Trump or Mitt Romney, they'd have the exact same reaction. It is. Because it's all about just gatekeeping what's allowed. And what's allowed is only liberal. Yep. Yep. That's yep. it. That is it. That's a good way of summarizing it, fellas. Here at Ruthless, we love this country and its amazing history. Defending our values today means remembering where we came from. There's no better way to connect with history than to hold a piece of it in your hand. For over 20 years, our great sponsor, CSN Mint, has offered a wide variety of certified U.S. Mint collectible coins and precious metals. For example, 
Right now, they're offering a Morgan silver dollar that was struck in 1878, a 140-year-old piece of American history that you can have as your own. Coins hold both an intrinsic and historic collectible value, while stacking silver in the form of bars or rounds holds an intrinsic value of the metal, coins, particularly certified coins, hold additional value as historic collectibles. So explore CSN Mint's ex extensive catalog of bullion bars, coins, and historic collectibles. Whether you're a seasoned investor or a passionate collector, you'll find a diverse range of products to suit your needs and preferences. At CSN Mint, trust is paramount. Every product you purchase includes the original Certificate of Authenticity, or is certified and graded by a third-party grader to ensure origin and purity. With CSN Mint, you can build your collection with confidence. Experience world-class customer service and support with CSN Mint. Their team of knowledgeable professionals is available to assist you every step of the way, from product selection to order fulfillment and beyond. Own a piece of our great American history. Go to csnmint.com backslash ruthless and use promo code ruthless at checkout to get a free Silver American Eagle over $30 in value with your purchase of $75 or more. Next segment. Oh, dude, this is for you. Yes. Yes. yes we're going yes, yes, to yes. the, the NC thing? No. No, we're doing. Uh, oh, we're doing, oh, yeah. The first one. Sure. Yeah. So according to the New York Post, Apple's green bubble Android texts fuel social stigma, DOJ claims in a landmark suit. The Justice Department called out Apple for afflicting Android smartphone users with the dreaded green bubble in text messages, calling it a mark of social stigma and <laughs> exclusion and blame as a part of its landmark antitrust case against the iPhone maker. Um... I want to know, uh, because we've complained about this at great length here on the Variety program, does the green bubble bother you? No, so, to me— Is it a social stick? I'm a what? proud Android user. <laughs> I, it's a sign of masculinity. <laughs> no. iPhones are for women and children. No. Oh, That's my, what they're designed for. My God. That's why you can't do anything serious with the thing. It's a, you know, it's a device to, to go on TikTok and, and to, to share— you know your 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 kids' photos on Facebook. It's a child's device. I mean, it's so that's a why you get it. Child's device. An Android. You see that green bubble? It's like, uh oh, the dude has entered the chat. It, right. It, this guy's gonna drop some hot takes. Maybe the feds will come knock. Is right? it real? There actually is this like a social justice DOJ move? I think against? it's part of. So Apple was rightly so getting a lot of like antitrust lawsuits because like yeah, but for this one, thing, one they, seems amazing. But that's the thing. It's like uh, they have. There were apps that came out that allowed people on on Android and Apple to chat without having any kind of like a um, a, a barrier between them. Yeah. Like I'm not talking like WhatsApp. It was essentially what's the one you guys use? iChat or something? The the, the what's the what's I'm the not text? telling you. And it, it, it's the very, child. It very looks, obviously it looks, it's not a, telling you. It's here. a child looking app, right? So I mean, I've tried twice. Uh, in recent years to buy the iPhone and use it, and it is a child's phone. It's like a Fisher-Price I mean, phone, essentially, insane. right? Mm. All the logos, all the icons, all of it looks like some children's shit, right? Like some see and say, like, you know, uh, old McDonald's, you, you got a spell. little pig. Speak and spell. Emoji, a speak and spell. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's like, a joke he, of a phone, dude. He like said? He said see and say. See and what say. the hell is Well, he that? doesn't have kids yet, but someday he's going to learn. My, uh, Joey... Joey and Henry have an old school speak and spell. Like, for example. Actually, you know what? I got to be honest. Kind of sucks. Speak <laughs> and spell, everybody thought was great. It sucks. <laughs> it sucks compared to what we have now for kids. And I know uh, oh, everyone's going to be like, oh, you millennial parent. Fuck you. <laughs> it's you know, soft. Speak and spell sucks. Every, kids and here's have, the thing have is, so many so many greater ways to learn. I, I, I got to correct yeah, the yeah, record yeah, yeah. real quick, Smug, though, on what you said originally. And that Last thing is, I'll say is iPhone users become iPad parents. It's a gateway. Oh, yeah. But go right at Are you calling me an iPad I'm parent? I'm just saying iPhone users turn to iPad parents. You've, it's like a gateway. But Whenever you're on the plane and the kid's freaking out and he even has the iPad and the parent's like, I don't know what to do. This is a moment where a parent would be needed. But uh, I already gave him the iPad. All, all, all my training has been expended on this moment. It's like, you've got an iPhone, don't you, buddy? Because the kid's got an iPad. Okay, listen here, the asshole. The Android owner is the one <laughs> okay. whose kid is shut up and, okay. and, like, asleep. Okay, so I have an iPhone. Uh, do you consider me an iPad parent? I don't know, man. 
You don't know. Oh, I don't know. I, you've I, met he's my reserving, children. He's reserving your, your judgment. Children, your children are very well behaved. I'm going to tell my fucking wife well this. <laughs> You're never invited over the house anymore. I've said, we can run the record. Wolf can play the video. Wow. I've said your kids are incredibly well behaved. Wow. Okay. So I think it's because he, 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 he has. It's he because has. I send you the Android text. Okay. It's like the household has so now just, been blessed. I, I, I got to give the listeners a peek behind the curtain here, and that is that we have a, a group chat, obviously. Yeah. Right? And so- me and Ashbrook and, and Holmes are all iPhone users and you're an Android user. And and what I find most disruptive to your usage of the Android is the reactions. I think the reactions is the most absurd thing that happens. It's like we're having a normal conversation. We're replying to each other and we're doing, you know, thumbs up reactions to people as we're in the text. But like when you thumbs up somebody else's text i get a fucking paragraph in there that says comfortably smug liked and then it reads the whole statement of well, the and it's so great because text. here's the thing it's for free i got a narrator on my side <laughs> hold, hold, like, hold i got a stenographer hold on I, i'm generally on your side on this duncan but i feel like that maybe proves the doj's what? The DOJ is right. Like, the, why is the, the thing DOJ is, right? So, so well, that the like, iPhones are for for women and children. It, there's a stigma a, involved. I don't think there's a stigma. Well, involved. there's certainly a stigma as far as I'm concerned. I, I look mean, at I'm inconvenienced, but I don't. I don't think there needs to be a stigma on Smugs. Well, behalf. I sti- I stigmatize him because he I look clearly at, is not stigmatized. I stigmatize as an all Android user. Users. He's he's. Instigmatizable. I'll yeah. tell you what. When, when, when someone yeah. on your plane is being obnoxious, ninety percent chance they have an iPhone out. Ninety percent. Try it, folks. Try it. Wait, are you kidding me? I 90% guarantee it. Chance 90% is it a 10% chance. Ninety percent chance. It's an iPhone user. Your phone. Ninety percent chance. I'm telling you, they're just, it's just bad people. Well, if you're being obnoxious, <laughs> that's and a your stigma. They're bad people. Name folks. is not comfortably <laughs> smug. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. So uh, this is interesting. Okay. Because you recall, like when we started the show, uh, we said our biggest thing was to try to put like the dorks that involve themselves in the political conversation in a locker. Stuff from the lockers. Mm -hmm. Because that's like what needed to happen. And I think we've done a pretty good job, by the way. There's a lot of dorks still out there. And I think we did that at the top of the show, by the way. Yeah. Well, in Technicolor. Yeah. 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 but it turns out, according to The Guardian, playground bullies do prosper. Uh, and they go on to earn more in middle age. Yeah. Mm. So listen to this. Children who displayed aggressive behavior at school, such as bullying or temper outbursts, are likely to earn more in middle age, according to a five-decade, five-decade They went through the study data. That upends the maxim that bullies do not prosper. They also say that they're likely to have a higher job satisfaction and to be more desirable in jobs, say researchers from the Institute of Social and Economic Research at the University of Essex. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Okay. So, um, look, I think at this time is incumbent upon us who have uh, advocating for bullying in certain aspects to qualify what we mean by that. Um, I think if you're talking about kids that are just like running through <laughs> and just like forearming, you know, and just like being assholes generally uh, without purpose or reservation, I'm not sure that this is true. And I'm not sure this this applies. I have, so I have a very simple rule of thumb because I've historically been very pro-bullying, right? I think it builds character. But you're going to qualify. There's always a pecking order in life. So you got to teach your kids. You got to be at the top of it, right? But th- th- here's how you, it works. You either punch up or you punch at your level. You never punch down. You never punch down. And also, like, look, you never start the fight. But you, you end it. You end it. Yeah. And, th- like, I think a, a really important part of the decay of American society. Yes, you're, you're getting to me now. This is my favorite thing. Yes. Is this idea that everybody's a victim. And it yep. doesn't matter. It's left, right, and center. Yeah. Every single person is like, well, look what somebody's doing to me. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I teach my kids is there's nothing that can be done to you if you don't allow it. And this strikes me as a perfect example of this in that you what you would qualify as a playground bully might just be somebody who's watched somebody kick somebody else's ass day in, day out, 
and been like, you know what? I've had enough of that shit. And they just go over and they maul them. Yeah. You know? And, and <clears throat> like, I think that, that our view of what constitutes, like, nice and good in today's world has been so convoluted by today's politics in that you're always victim. You're always some, you're always It's a competition of how much of a victim are you? And that like, and somehow by being like, I am the most victimized for things that absolutely like might not even have happened in my lifetime. You know what I mean? Like an Olympics of who's the biggest victim is, is, is what is considered winning now. Being a victim today means you didn't get everything that you want. That's it. Yeah. That, that's, that's the reality. And, uh, you'll appreciate this Holmes. I don't know if you remember this, but like we, um, we were over at your house, gosh, uh, back in like October or November. Okay. And, uh, we were watching football. It's like a Sunday thing. I think you were there too, Smug. Um, you came a little bit late. But it's <laughs> typical in smug fashion. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, but he wore a cape. Yeah. But <laughs> my, uh, you know, my son Joey like has a, a really big heart. Like he's yeah. a very nice. Uh, he's a good kid. Kid, and uh, he was in the trampoline with your two kids. Yeah. And uh, we were we were grilling. We were doing some ribs and stuff yeah. over there, as, as you are one to do, and yep. you're fantastic at it. And we're, right. we're working over there on the grill, and we're watching over there at the trampoline, and your two sons are sort of ganging up on, on my son. <laughs> and uh, and I loved it. I loved it. And and and, and you and I actually felt yeah, a little worried You felt worried. You felt, yeah. wor- you, fe- you felt worried, which, which I respect. And your two, two boys were sort of, not bullying, but like, Joey, they're playing with some balls, and and Joey was like, "It's time to share. It's time <laughs> to share," and he's like trying to like be really diplomatic about it. Again, big heart. Yep. And they are just straight, just like owning his ass, <laughs> owning my like, son. Nothing in this life yeah. is given, <laughs> <Yeah>. Joey. <laughs> and, 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 well, and I think I made a couple runs you at did. like trying to make them it, play right nicer. And, and what Duncan I said, Duncan is like, don't, don't, don't. And the reason why I said don't is because Joey is the firstborn. And when you are the firstborn, I think it is a good lesson early in your life to learn that you don't get everything you want all the time. Mm. It's it's okay to lose. And you should feel that sometimes very mm. early in your life. So you learn to deal with not getting what you want. And... I liked it. I liked seeing him get upset that he wasn't getting what he wanted, and I appreciated that. And I feel like if more parents did that and embraced that as an imper- important learning point for their young kids, they wouldn't deal with this bullshit where we we call everything bullying because it's not bullying. I yeah. remember that, dude. That was a. That, I mean, I've said many times. There's solid parents on this show. That was like an extremely quality. Dude, it was a very moment. different thing because, like, as you imagine. Uh, all of us who have kids, you deal with parents of all kinds. And the last thing you want is for parents to feel like their kids aren't safe in your area, right? So, like, you go out of your way to try to, like, pull your kids back from situations that would... And so I rolled over watching all this, and Duncan's like, don't, don't. It's like let the boy watch. That, I mean, that, it's, it, and that is it, it was like that. Uh, what was it like Roman generals when they would come back from victory mm-hmm. in, in, in their chariots? They'd have like uh, someone that hold the crown over them, memento mori. Like remember, you are right. mortal. That's like your first point. You got to learn that. You yeah. do learn for the Romans, man. That's a great lesson. Listen, it's a big deal. All right, so North Carolina, you're totally fucked. Do you know? I this? don't think so. No, do you, you see this? According to UPI. Uh, North Carolina officials warn residents there could be bears under their homes. Kill them. That's a th- that, so that's a beautiful thing. I could tell everyone that North Carolina is the best state to live in, but I'm scared. There's already a significant problem of New Yorkers, especially post-COVID, during COVID, moving to North Carolina. We, we have, we've had Democrat governors. You may have started the bears under your homes thing, so well, nobody else I goes. mean, here's the thing is that, like, to this day in North Carolina, you can still have a gun. You could shoot that bear. You could keep your home safe. But for how long is the thing? That's the worry. To me, like, if the, government if, gets if, in your if, way. If, the, if the government's like, yo, there could be bears in your house, the good thing is in North Carolina, you could shoot them. 
in like New York, they'll arrest you and give the bear your house, right? <laughs> so North Carolina is still safe. Do we have for a now. clip of this, Spigats? Yeah, it's, uh, it's from California, but it's the same thing. Oh, we got it. We got it. We got a similar clip. Uh, a clip five. Uh, this is of a, a Lake Tahoe, California issue. But it, it, it raises. One more time. Is that a. It's a bear underneath that home. Wow. Wow. Holy there it is. Shit. So they set off fireworks to get the bear out. That's the thing, is, and that's a total California move because <laughs> Gavin will not have a gun. In North Carolina, you get a free rug. It's a great deal. If I found a, if I found a bear in my house in, in, in North rug. Carolina, it's dead, free, and I finally free, have the rug. A free rug. Living room, new rug. <laughs> I don't know, man. Bring that's him a, on, man. That's I a, would kill him. It's a tough shot. Well, apparently the whole thing is like these people, and I, I, I want you to deal with this. These people that that are interacting with this situation, they actually want the homeowners to be okay with the bears living under the home. Listen to this. Quote, the fun part of the job is to convince a homeowner that it's okay to have a bear under the house. You're kidding me. So, no. he, so this, this leads into this separate thing I read about where the Biden administration is reintroducing wild bears into parts of the country where he, people live. Oh, I saw To this. be like, hey, you know, like you got to put up with this. No, dude. Like, <laughs> no. The reason humans exist is because we defeated nature. Right. Like, the war ended a very long time ago. So we don't need a, to fight this again. What you just nature said was on, what you just said was on Fox News. Biden administration accelerates plans to unleash grizzly bears in rural community over widespread local. Outrage. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, we had already defeated God, they nature hate people. once. They hate people so much. They do. These are the worst people <laughs> in the world. We, we 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 beat animals. God gave us dominion over animals, and they want the war. They're working it back. They're working it back. Oh. But I mean, you, you just put some honey on a pool, and I think it takes care of all Bro, of that, like think right? about think about the life of like a, 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 an American citizen at this point. You have bears and illegals unleashed in your communities by Joe Biden. Like, <laughs> how can he make things more difficult at this point? <laughs> so like bad. the inflation is tough, and now you got a bear. It's so bad. It's so bad. Uh, all right. So one of our favorite guests. Yes. That oh, we, we didn't have, even tease. That we've ever had on this program is here to do the first presidential recap of their own experience. And we just love him to death. Can't wait for this. You guys are going to enjoy every minute of it. Doug Berg of North Dakota. I want to welcome to the program one of our all-time favorite guests. I mean, this guy never lets us down. Mm -hmm. We've done crazy stuff with him. We've eaten snake. Rattlesnake yeah. nachos. <laughs> In Iowa, yeah. <laughs> Governor Doug Bergham, welcome back, pal. It's great to be back. And I got to tell you, for the people that are just listening in, before you come on the show, they actually, these guys that look like attack helicopter pilots, right there, <laughs> yeah. they do a countdown. Three, two, one, and then it's like blast off. It's I mean, you feel the energy in the room just take <laughs> off and go. I mean, we try to be a little bit professional. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's got this studio and all these I lights. Should, I think you should count down from like a hundred okay. instead of three. <laughs> build, just make build you sit that. through it. Yeah, and then that could be an extra clip that people could pay extra to watch. On <laughs> oh, the, yeah, on the front yeah, because that would be worth paying for. Yeah. No <laughs> question about it. Well, listen, you've been a busy guy. Uh, the last time that the nation. Uh, saw you as a candidate for president, and then you, obviously you made a big endorsement afterwards. You've been helping out ever since, it sounds like. I, I have, and uh, happy to be supporting President Trump. But before we get into that, which I'm sure we'll talk about, I do, for the four of you, I do want, and your, and your great production team, I do want to say a genuine thank you. I mean, gratitude. I mean, I, I typically in my life I always lead with gratitude. But when you're running a presidential campaign and you're from a small state, yeah. There are a lot of people that just like, oh, he's from a small state. He's from a small town in a small state. And I want to say genuinely of the people that I met during the entire campaign, the most fun I had, the most insight, the most everything was with the Ruthless team. Oh, no. thank so you so much. Nice. That's very, very appreciated. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm not, not just saying that. I mean, because but part of it was, I got to tell you, and I'm sure all your guests feel this way, but I actually felt seen. Mm -hmm. I felt heard. I felt respected. And I think that you folks are ruthless in one area and you're ruthless in your curiosity mm, that's and curiosity really nice. curiosity is what drives innovation i've always been someone with my kids i'm like hey you know i don't care 
what grades you get. I care about are you asking good questions every day mm. at school. Mm. Oh, and I cool. drop them off. I'd say like, hey, ask good questions today. And then at night, I'd say, I didn't say, did you get an A on that test? I'd say, tell me the best question you asked. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so. I mean, that's look, great if parenting advice. Yeah. I'm, I'll, I'm I'll, taking notes over here. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Also, if you kind of want to be successful, you should listen to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's figured it out in just about every facet of life. That's yeah. incredible. Thank you but, very much. Yeah, very much. Gratitude so for all of you. Yeah, Appreciate but, it. But for, I mean, from a selfish perspective, you are incredibly great content. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've done great things as a governor. I mean, yeah. your life story itself is like a movie. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, we were happy to help. It was also terrific for our numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and we got to eat snake, which, yeah. which was delightful. Right. No, it, it was, and I and I'm and I hope that we've expanded the market for yeah. all the uh, yeah. for all the free range non GMO organic rattlesnake uh, <laughs> ranchers out there. I think we I think we gave them a boost like they've never had. <laughs> yeah, I think the key is like you mix it with they have a kind of a spice like a jalapeno or something to it, and it had the venom. Yeah, yeah, the it venom, in there. It venom sauce, I think, is what they call that. <laughs> oh, that's what yeah. it was. Yeah. Oh, good. That's why I was feeling a little weird. I thought it was the 17 beers we drank on the way through the fair, and then I guess maybe it was the venom that did the trick. <laughs> but that was fun, right? I mean, look, you, you look back on a presidential campaign, which, by the way, exceeded all expectations coming in. Everybody, like you said, mm -hmm. small state, I ah, never heard of them. Like, let's just discount this guy. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of innovation leads to you getting on a debate stage mm -hmm. and starting to post some poll numbers that are well within the thick of things. You surprise a lot of people. And, like, you know, the whole experience was gigantic. Yeah. Well, it was an honor, I mean, for Catherine and I. I mean, when you're, uh, you know, I, and of course, I love Theodore Roosevelt. And in North Dakota, we're building a presidential library for Theodore Roosevelt. Audacious goal, $350 million project in a town of 113 people. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so, yes. But, uh, you know, I mean, TR famously talked about being in the arena, but when you actually can get out of the stands and you're in the arena and, and you're doing it out of a heart of service because you care about this country and the people that are here. And it was it was very inspiring for us, the people that we met, the people we could talk to, the stories we heard. And, and uh, it makes you know made me just want to you know work even harder at trying yeah. to drive things yeah. forward. So that that was fantastic, and we thought again we did set some records. It was uh, you might know that first debate was now named the best presidential debate by someone standing on one leg. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was a uh, that's in the book. Can I can I just take can I just go back to this? Yeah, I mean this is a, the so, story that we never got the full download of. Yeah. So we were obviously homers. So we were big fans of yours and, and you were courteous enough to spend a lot of time with us and getting to know you and your wife and everything else. And so we're we're kind of rooting this on. We're like, God, he's on the stage. Like this is great. Let's see. And then was it like two days before? It was the less, night before, yeah, right? less than 24 hours. Yeah. Less than 24 hours? You're playing basketball? Yes. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've played ball my whole life, and we're, we're heading into March Madness. You guys got your bracket yeah. coming up here. You guys, yeah, you guys think Madness. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're, you're there. Uh, so we're in Milwaukee, and these guys say, hey, we got a chance to get on a court at Marquette. And I'm like, I'm not passing up oh, a chance man. to go. Yeah. Were these people DeSantis campaign offers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? Like your own friend said yeah. this? Yeah, it was it was that way. And uh, our, <laughs> my eldest son was there too. He's 30. He was there. We were anyway. We, we were uh, just gonna, we're not gonna, you know, do anything. We're just gonna shoot around, shoot around. <laughs> then we get over there and this people, hey, you want to play some pickup game? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And then then we're playing. Then we're playing. You know, it's like two and two, three on three. And then all of a sudden we're down five. And I'm like, I'm not losing a game. You're pushing. I'm not losing to these guys the day before a debate. <laughs> <And> so. <laughs> So we were. It was. Uh, I, I tell people it was raining threes, and then the floor got wet, and then, I, and then I blew my Achilles. I mean, I just I can't imagine your thought process as you're presumably laying on the floor, looking at your Achilles. I mean, this is one of the most painful injuries you can have as a person, <laughs> yeah. right? It's horrible. Yeah. And you're like. Oh no! Because <laughs> I mean, well, you gotta know this is gonna impact everything. Well, well I knew exactly, partly because I. I played competitive ball my whole life as in in uh, competitive leagues. Most of the guys, and they started out my age, and then they were ten years younger, then twenty right. years younger, and then thirty mm -hmm. years younger. Yeah. And I got some great. I got a great story sometime, which we won't share here about how we won two state titles in the same weekend, 
playing on an open team and an over 30 team <laughs> wow. when, when we only had 10 guys, but we were shuffling them back and forth like hockey players, but between two courts while the championships were going on. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm like telling a guy like, you know, hey, how many fouls do you have? And he's like, I don't know. It's either seven or eight because he's <laughs> playing back and forth between two games. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. I said, well, don't get nine because yeah. you get nine, you're going to be out of one of the games. I don't yeah. know which one, but you got to, if you're at eight, stop fouling people. So we were like a multi-level, you know, chess game in some other <laughs> dimension but anyway so i've had a lot of fun playing ball my whole life but three times in my career i've been on the court when someone's blown their achilles oh mm-hmm. okay three so times you knew what the, you knew what so was i know how painful it is i know the thing. and every time they went down they looked around and said who kicked me somebody kicked me oh who was behind me so when i went down you're looking backwards and i everybody runs over you're laying on the floor looking up and you got this extreme pain you think it's you know blown like exploding oh. mop head you know oh. you're anyway and i said who kicked me and then when i heard myself say that you're like oh. the thought process was oh nobody kicked me i just blew my achilles and i got i got my <laughs> debut presidential debate uh, in less than 24 hours and then christy slunk out the back door yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so did you have to do, like, debate prep from a hospital bed? Or, like, what did you have to do that night? Well, we, we went, you know, we went to the ER yeah. to confirm what I already knew. And then they said, hey, there's, you know, we can give you these prescription painkillers, but there's nothing else we can do. And I'm like, well, that would be an interesting way to yeah. do the debate. <laughs> you can ask like, Governor Perry how that went. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so we w- went straight ahead with the whole thing. But then as uh, <clears throat> So you didn't take any painkillers? I, I took a couple Tylenol. Tylenol is what Tylenol. 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 I mean, I just wanted to take the edge off it a little bit. That didn't really <laughs> help. And and then and we're and I you know I learned something. All the other candidates are coming and they're going through the. They say they call it a walk through, but you come individually. Yeah. And there are like twenty people there in the producing crews, and everybody's like, "Where's my camera? And where do I look? And you know, where do I go during breaks?" And I, I came in. I said, "I got one question." And they said, "What's that?" And I said. Are those podiums bolted to the floor? <laughs> <laughs> and to my surprise, they said yes, they are. Yeah. So you could do some heavy leaning on the podium. Yeah, but yeah, I was I was a three point stance, two arms and one leg. <laughs> but, but actually, at the end, by the end, my right leg, the one that was not injured, was actually <laughs> bruised. <than> the other. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, have you guys ever stood on one leg for two hours? No, no. I can't say. I have. I, yeah. No, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, even if you got a podium, but it's. But three months later, after running around on that that uh that knee rover thing i had i could i could have stood for five hours on one leg yeah they got like a massive left yeah, leg. if i had been if i had been in some kind of uh, monty python one-legged kicking contest <laughs> yeah. at the end of that thing i would have been awesome but on day one i was not prepared to stand on one leg for two hours i mean did you have to did you have to audible on the fly in terms of what your strategy was or are you just going to go out and try to execute as best you can well, we weren't even sure I could get on the stage. Yeah, you had to go I up mean. steps. Yeah. And so we're like, we're not sure. So we went there for the walkthrough, and I figured out I could get on the stage without crutches and get behind that podium. And wow. Then, oh. And then people leave at the break, and they're like, hey, no, no, I'm good. I'm just like, uh. Because <laughs> you can't move. <laughs> I'm like, right? where, am I going? where am I going? Everybody's going to get a glass of water <laughs> yeah, or something. You're just like. Stadium of people out there, and you're standing there during the breaks. Kind of <laughs> Hanging out. <laughs> Just awkwardly staring at all of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, quite an experience. Obviously, that was, I think it was the most watched debate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sure was. Of all of them. And it was, a, you know, we yeah. were there. It was obviously a huge. It was exactly half of the number of people that watched the last episode of The Apprentice oh. in 2015. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, well, it was the that... most watched debate, but it was not. Puts it in perspective. Yeah, it was a. <laughs> <laughs> And, well, and I think I know who is starring in The Apprentice. Yeah, I, I, I speaking of speaking of The Apprentice, I do have a question to ask you that I'm sure you're getting from every single person that you talk to in the media, and you know this question. You've answered it a thousand times, but when you think about who President Trump wants as a vice president and the way he thinks about these things, he always thinks of central casting. So who better than John Wayne, the rattlesnake killer, uh, <laughs> to be his vice president? So he, the question is. Is it a job that you would say yes to, or is it a job offer you'd say yes to, and do you think it's possible? Well, I, I think the that whole debate's changed a little bit because since uh, JFK Jr. is talking about uh, – Another New York, a New York Jets quarterback who also blew his Achilles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it, it, it might could be a prerequisite. It, it, well, it could be. It could be the blown Achilles. <laughs> but they, but you know who who would who would who would be better you know than Aaron Rodgers? But I, I think uh, 
I, I haven't seen it yet. You guys could be the first to but I think Mahomes has got to be on Trump's list. <laughs> got to be on the list. <laughs> don't you think? I, I mean, I don't not. know. He's giving you a full not. punt, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the full punt. And I understand that. I yeah. understand no. that. There's probably nothing uh, less that President Trump likes than people speculating about their own candidacies for vice president. But, I, I mean, from our perspective, sure makes sense to us. Yeah, yeah. It? yeah. I mean, another businessman there when this country is in such a dire situation to help turn things around, it seems like a dream team. Yeah, yeah, yeah you could but, do a lot worse. And, I mean, you, you said that, you know, you come from a small state and people weren't paying attention. America is made up of small states and yeah, small towns. Right. And the yeah. problem with Washington is nobody gets that. And I feel like that would bring an awful lot to Trump's ticket that, you know, people would overlook. Right. Well, and this may not be a plus comparison, but last time I checked, Joe Biden's from a much smaller state than <laughs> yeah. North Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That could be the argument against small. I don't know. But we're, but I, I'd say the, the you guys know what I ran. I wasn't running for a cabinet position, wasn't right. running for anything. It wasn't to be VP, it wasn't any of that stuff. It's And I'd say more important now than ever. And I just would go around the country as a governor and say, having served under, I had 36 days under Obama. Mm-hmm. which was a nightmare because of the Dakota Access Pipeline protests yeah. were going mm-hmm. on. And now in federal court, we just wrapped up last week, seven years later, completing this federal court uh, where we're making the case the federal government owes North Dakota $38 million mm. for law enforcement and cleanup because the White House, the Obama White House, had their thumb on the scale on, on behalf of the protesters. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of work in 36 no, and days to make people's lives miserable yeah. from the federal government and Barack Obama. Yeah, no, and it's a it's, it's it's all it's all come out in the court documents, but it's just clear. I mean, emails all the way to the White House. Unbelievable. Uh, FBI, FBI agents that are on uh, video depositions saying, when we're like, why did those FBI guys leave? Well, they were told by their boss, get out of North Dakota. You're not there to help North Dakota. Unbelievable. Unreal. Yeah. I mean, it does, I wish I could tell you it surprises me. Yeah. So that was my start. Yeah. I mean, welcome, private sector. And then day one, I got 10,000 people <laughs> camping illegally. Right. And that, like, so I have that. And then we had four years of wind at our back with President Trump. And cabinet secretaries visiting North Dakota, the vice president, the president, uh, you know, delegating power back to the states and you guys know that i'm a states rights guy yeah mm-hmm. and then you know joe biden takes office my job was the same i was still governor mm-hmm. but then everything changed because that was the beginning yeah. of the onslaught which has never quit on the red tape and the regulations and we're fighting 26 different regulatory efforts right now against the biden administration all those we got lawyers we're staffing up some are in court some are going to court to try and they're, they're trying to you know kill you know, they're killing the energy industry in our country. At the same time, we're empowering Iran and Russia and yeah, Venezuela right. and helping China with our the energy policies are destabilizing the world. They're killing American jobs. They're raising the prices of everything with inflation. So that so I, the most important thing for this country right now, if it's a binary choice, Trump versus Biden, President Trump, we've seen what he's been able to do. The world was safe. The world was prosperous. Mm-hmm. And now uh, we've got to get him back in. And mm-hmm. it's him plus the 4,000 people that he will appoint across yeah. across that federal government that will then stop the madness that's going on right now under the Biden administration. Well, it's yeah. really well said. I'm glad to hear that, strategically speaking, uh, you've got some quibbles with being more reliant on Beijing than Minot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hey. it's wild, right? Yeah. Well, hey, and speaking of Minot, I mean, we've got uh, uh, it's the only base in the country that's got two of the three legs of the nuclear triad. That's right. Uh, you know, we've got the missile wing and the bomber wing. And I think I shared with you before, we're, we're trying to get the USS North Dakota relocated to <laughs> Lake Sakakawea. <laughs> so we can have, we'd have, we have a submarine moving have back. Full we have all three legs of the triad yeah. in North Dakota. I mean, what? Canada would not. Yeah, they, they would not try that. They would well, not. They would, yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and, if, and I tell people you don't, you don't want to mess with North Dakota. Right now, today, if we seceded from the nation, we'd be the second, third largest nuclear power in the world <laughs> today. Incredible. Something yeah. to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Something to think about. Yeah. Well, and it's springtime, so the Red River, you might be able to just drop it in there, right? You get the. It doesn't flood every year. No. Basically, the Red River. Uh, it won't this year. It won't this, this year. year. Yeah. I mean, I've, this is my family's up from That's right. the area, so well, I have it, some. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. And then when it does, then it's, it goes from being 100 yards wide to like 10 miles wide. It's, um, have you guys seen this? No. Yeah. It's incredible. I haven't seen it. Honestly, it's one of, everybody pays attention to disaster recoveries that happen in Florida with hurricanes or, you know, all through the southeast. Nobody pays attention because these guys just handle it. But, like, it transforms an entire landmass into one big body of water once every, I don't know, few years. Yep. 
it, the likes of which if the rest of the country had one minute dealing with it, it would be like, well, oh, it's it's all over. It's all yeah. over. <laughs> Cancel the Constitution. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's for real, though. Yeah, well, the Red River, full name, Red River of the North, flo- it's the border between North Dakota and Minnesota, flows north up to Lake Winnipeg and the Hudson Bay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, when it's flowing north in the spring, you it's still see. frozen. Oh. It's still frozen there, mm-hmm. so all the water's coming, and then the ice is not going out yet. So in addition to water, water everywhere, it's the water's about 33 degrees. Mm-hmm. Oh. So you <laughs> die if you're in it after yeah. like 60 seconds. So other than that, it's not a problem. But no, it's <laughs> not, I mean, it's just like <laughs> a too bad. perpetual disaster preparedness. You guys don't ever get enough credit for that, probably because you're North Dakotans. Right. And, and you just and don't do seek just credit it. for yeah. it. Yeah. Just handle it. <laughs> so, all right. So in addition to your endorsement... Uh, you haven't stopped working. I understand you're traveling around doing like Lincoln Day dinner type things or county meetings, big Republican events. You were just in Nevada not long ago. Yes. I was there last Saturday, Clark County. Uh, that'll be one of the 19 counties. It's a swing county. Yeah. And I got to tell you, at least the intensity for President Trump, very high. Mm-hmm. That gives you a lot to feel good about. And it was, I was thanking all the veterans in the room. And this is a group of like five, 600 people. Mm-hmm. Thirty percent were veterans. Yeah, wow. I mean, amazing. so that, I mean, so I mean, the strength and support there. So you got retirees, you got veterans, uh, and then what else is there? You got women, you got some young people, you got Hispanics. There's a whole group there that are like all in on Trump. So I mean, yeah. I feel like he's winning on all demographics. But Harris has been to Clark County twice in the last three weeks. Biden, I think, is going there this week. I mean, this could be one of the counties that actually swings the election. And and of course, uh, you know, what we're up against is you've got. Uh, unions, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and we know that uh, you guys experienced with Nevada. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, I mean, you know, the, every every other county in Nevada is going to vote for President Trump. It's yeah. going to be as red as red can be. But seventy five percent of the votes are in Clark County yeah. in in that Las Vegas area, and it's a uh, it's it's different than it was four years ago and different than six years ago, and that's going to be interesting in that and some other counties how demographically they've changed. With no the question, growth. is that do you think, you know, I mean, obviously you're interacting with the Trump team and they're using you as a surrogate in different places, and I think that that is actually really interesting. Clark County, perfectly described by you, swing county, a must-have type deal if you're going to carry a state like Nevada, but there are little cities and little counties all over the country in must-have states that have this kind of similar thing and outside looking in i i'd send bergham to all of those places Mm -hmm. because it's like here's a relatable person who speaks your language i never have thought that conservative policies have ever been offensive but there are different people present them in different ways Mm -hmm. and it seems like you're kind of a perfect fit for an awful lot of these demographics that you know we were light on in 2020. well i mean you throw uh, ranchers and farmers and right. small business owners and entrepreneurs in a room, and and I, I love talking to them. I mean, when <laughs> I was in the software business, our entire customer base was small and medium sized businesses. I mean, I, I I get what entrepreneurs go through. I get what they're going through right now. And when I look out in that the group of people there in Clark County, and I know that there's people in that room that uh, probably have some savings, and then I think about thirty percent of their savings disappeared in the last three years yeah. under mm-hmm. Joe Biden inflation, and they know it. People are motivated. I mean, mm-hmm. they know that they're they got a raise. Real income went up when President Trump was in office. They got a raise. Mm-hmm. Joe Biden, they've gotten a huge pay cut. Yeah, mm. economically, yeah. and they can feel it. You can tell them all you want about you know inflation slowing down. The prices haven't come down, mm-hmm. and so th- these these guys are they're they're motivated. But I told every one of them, hey, you guys are patriots, but you got to go find one more, two more, three more of you. We got to get people to you know get out because this could come down to. Not how we all feel or who's energized, it's who's actually going to vote. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then making sure that we've actually got secure voting in those 19 counties. Yeah, mm-hmm. no question about it. So, I mean, let me ask you this. Uh, you've obviously been well-known professionally in the circles that you ran in, incredibly successful business. Uh, obviously well-known in North Dakota as a governor. Um, you run for president, all of a sudden you're like well-known, right? I mean, everybody knows who you are. What was that experience like nationwide? I mean, you can walk into a lot of different places and if they don't know immediately know who you are, they're like, where do I know that guy from? Right? It's a different feeling, right? Well, it is, but we're not quite there yet because I still had an incident just recently where somebody saw me and they said, hey, hey, and I, you, know, you think they're going to be like, I, you know, I saw you on whatever. And they're like, 
hey, can you take a picture of me with my family? Oh, that's so <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, sure I can. I'm very good at that. I've been taking, <laughs> taking pictures of my daughter for years. I mean, I know how to like get the feet in here and get the lighting prop it. just right. Don't get too close, Dad. You don't need you don't need to stand that close. We've got there's zoom on those cameras. Yeah. We can edit it in post production. Does she make it do your thing? Look, you, you you put the camera up a little oh. bit at an angle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got a shot here. Yeah, you got it. You, you oh got yeah, it. a slimming it, technique. It's important. Yeah. yeah. Well, and ask the first lady. You get it up a couple of feet. That's your. It takes ten years off your yeah. <laughs> off of you. <laughs> like, you got to get it up. It's right. I see. That. I mean, we're learning everything yeah. here yeah. today. Yeah. Incredible. So I, you're just staying on the road, right? I mean, you're well, gonna keep doing stuff. How's the but, foot, by the way? Well, I mean, it's great. I, I'm you know missing my first season of skiing and I'm missing my first season of basketball. But I want to give a shout out to my team back home. They uh, you know finished second in the top league in Fargo uh, this year without me. And I and I think if I'd have been there, we probably would have been third or fourth. <laughs> but, I, I, but I but I still 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 sponsoring a team. Uh, but it, it's it's sad. It's first first year I'm missing an entire season of basketball. But you're rehabbing that thing like. Aaron Rodgers. I am. Well, not exactly. Because I, I had a chance to go to a Jets game this last fall. At Jets versus Eagles, we were going to do a fundraiser because the offensive center for the Jets is from Fargo. Went to high school in oh, Fargo. Oh, okay. 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 All right. And, I, and I'll tell you his name, Connor McGovern. And then you'll say, oh, yeah, but there's actually two offensive linemen in the NFL named Connor McGovern. Okay. 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 Well, this is this, a little bit. This is the good one and the one that plays for the, the Jets. And he, and he, was, he got to do four snaps with Aaron Rodgers. I oh man! But yes. Catherine and I immediately watched the tape because we're like, "Oh, please don't let have Connor been the guy to let the guy through." That oh yeah, right. And it wasn't Connor. Oh well, Connor made the block on that good. one. Well, Fargo comes through again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So 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 <laughs> anyway, Fargo with Connor there, through. Connor there, and we we've watched him in high school and in college and in when he's at the Broncos and the Jets. And so we're like, "Hey, we're we're going to go to a game sometime this year with his folks. Uh, let's have a fundraiser. Well, then it'll be a big game. Well, then Rogers is out." Yeah, but we're still went ahead with it, but then because of because of Connor, we got passes to get down on the field. Oh, so we're so down amazing. on the field, nice. down on the field ahead of the game, and we're down there, you know. And, they, and there's Aaron Rodgers, and we got hurt like the same week. Oh, and I'm on yeah. a little knee scooter like Grandma with the, with the you know the air cast on, and he's throwing passes. He's throwing darts. <laughs> he's throwing passes. Yeah, he's throwing darts back and forth, and he's like, and people are like, ESPN's filming him and doing whatever, and he's telling people he's going to be back for the playoffs, and. And he comes over and we shake hands and say hi and whole thing and then he leaves and people are like, Buddy, look, he's out there. he's out there doing that look at you. He's making you look bad. Yeah, and and I said, Well I said, Well, there's one thing and they said, What's that? He said, He's not running a state. Okay. <laughs> he's got thirty five million reasons to work out every yeah. single day on his rehab and I'm a, and I'm actually running a state and running for president. I'm doing two things yeah. right now. Yeah, so he got a little ahead of me and I don't know I, I think I he may have gone to a few ayahuasca ceremonies in there. Too, yeah, yeah, no, have... it sounds like there might be some supplemental yeah, work there. Yeah, there could have been some work that wasn't being recommended by my PT. <laughs> thing, but I, I, but, he's, but I, I'm, doing, I, I'm doing well, but I got my, my, my two boys are pushing me hard because they want me yeah. back for ski season next oh. year. They don't care about basketball, but yeah, I got to get back. For, you got to get back. For, yeah, so I, lo I, I love it. Like he's comparing himself to like one of the great athletes yeah. of our era. Yeah. He's like, screw you, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Making me look bad. I got basketball season to get back to. I love that. I mean, it's your personality in a nutshell. So, uh, so what are you doing from here? You're 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 probably going back home, and then, but you're going to keep a busy schedule on the campaign front. Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, got about 260 days left uh, as governor. Mm -hmm. Driving hard. Uh, on that. And you might think, oh, it's a lame duck thing. In North Dakota, the outgoing governor gets to present the budget for the oh, next two years because oh, wow. our, our legislature meets every two years. Okay. And it's, they meet uh, two years, they meet every two years for 80 days. That's the maximum. Mm. And I've got a lot stuff done as governor. I was trying to get it changed so they would only meet for two days every 80 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I came up short on that one. But they'll, but they'll be back. They'll be back for their 80 days next year. But we get to set the budget. And when I came in, I mean, one of the things that was interesting coming from the private sector is there was no strategic planning process. Oh. And you say, well, what was it? what's the big deal about that? Well, if there's a budgeting process, then the budgeting process is every agency at every state and at the federal level. If we get more money, we're winners. If we get yeah. less money, we're losers. The only thing coming out of that whole legislative thing was, did I get more money? Yeah. And I'm like, 
when you're in the private sector, you don't sit around and argue as CEOs about the inputs. Right. You know, like, hey, I spent more in sales and marketing than you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, Congrats, it's like, everybody. Yeah. You know, it's who sold the most. I mean, yeah. what your customer sad is. I mean, what new innovations. So it's always about outcomes. So we've been working hard during the time I've been governor to change the culture. So that starts with a strategy review. And I, with my team, we go through 72 different agencies from the smallest little you know, arts council to the biggest human services. And we'd be like, tell us who's your customer, mm. what's the measure, what are you trying to do? And then we need to fund it to, for you to achieve your objectives. Mm. But also tell us what you're not gonna do. And then we also now say, tell us how you're gonna use AI to speed up the productivity. So we're driving AI further than probably any other state is doing down into the thing because like we don't have enough resources. I'm like, well, hey, there's this free thing that speaks 26 languages and can code mm. uh, and we can give one to every one of your team members. Right. Would you like that? And, and a guy way, who actually knows free. what I, AI is too. Yeah. That's yeah. refreshing. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, so we're having fun. So we're going to put together the best budget we've ever have put together. I get a chance to introduce it uh, before I leave office. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then our great Lieutenant Governor, Tammy Miller, who is the CEO of a large multi-state uh, electrical distribution company, employee-owned, fantastic company. Uh, recruited her to be the chief operating officer of the state, which is a new role, role that we had created because it actually, you're running an operation, yeah. you gotta have operating people. And then I had a chance to appoint her as Lieutenant Governor. So hopefully when she's, uh, if she wins uh, in a tight race, she'll be terrific. But if she wins, then it will, it will keep the train running there. So it's my I mean, objective. It my, for a generation. Yeah, so our objectives, you know, are but we've got to get President Trump elected because yeah. it changes everything for every, for every American on the economy, energy, national security, absolutely. And then get uh, Tammy Miller elected and then, and then they, then it's wide open. And you I get to be... saddle them all with a bunch of good decisions on your way out the door. Yes. yes. <laughs> I exactly. love it. Well, we can't thank you enough for coming in here. We always love you. You're welcome anytime. We should probably find a new adventure somewhere out in the States over the next yeah. few months. Yeah, and I and I do. Uh, I haven't invited any other podcast, podcast crew, but you guys should think about the library because the, the opening is July 4th, 2026 for the oh, Theodore wow. Roosevelt Presidential Library. It's an official USA 250 event. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in all living presidents get invited. Huh. Mm. And so the, you, so people have said, hey, are you gonna have fireworks at this thing? <laughs> and I'm like, 4th of July, and I'm like, well, if we have if we have Obama and Trump, uh, <laughs> yeah. we, we might not need that, fireworks. Yeah, that'll that'll be the be like, because when you open up when you open up a library, then they invite everybody who's alive. I don't know if Biden will make it, uh, <laughs> twenty twenty six. He'll get an, he'll get an invite if so he's a, as a former former president. That's I mean, if you're a living former president, you don't yeah, have to be the sitting go. one. You could go to that, but you guys should be there. Yep. And it's a well, and it's Smug's a big library guy. Yeah, yep. sounds like my kind of thing. So yep. yeah. So, well, this is the first. This is the first. I mean, AI digital. Uh, this is going to be more Disney than dust. I mean, this is going to be Disney, the right, the good stuff. The good Disney, Disney, good, yeah. good Disney. So it's going to be amazing. And then the other thing is we're, it's, uh, it's on these 93 acres on top of a bluff uh, looking into the national park. So mm. it's going to have oh, the most wow. spectacular Beautiful. Great location. View. And it's where Roosevelt Ranch is where he came to North Dakota to transform himself. His wife and his mother died on the same day on Valentine's Day in 1884, and he was... Rough. broken as a as a as a person mm -hmm. and gave their his new three day old daughter you know alice to his sister and said i'm going west and he went as far as the train would go and he ended up in the badlands of north dakota and and then he was ranching there the next four years he transformed himself from a sickly easterner to the rough and tumble cowboy that became mm -hmm. the rough rider that became the charge up san juan hill that became the only president to win the medal of honor mm -hmm. and then he you know he transformed himself and then he transformed our country and he said many times never would have been president if not for his time in in, in North, North Dakota. Dakota. Mm -hmm. And got, so, man knows how to make a sale, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I'm already yeah. interested. I, 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 I want to go. Yeah, yeah we're going to go. But yet this, I mean, other, you haven't thought about how do I get to a presidential library? And you think, well, we'll drive there and walk in the door. But this is a, a, next to the Matahe Trail, single track, 150 mile, but one of the best mountain biking, hiking, and horseback trails in our country, going, connecting, you know, through yeah. the three different parts of the TR Park. Uh, it goes right up to the library. So wow. you, when you guys come, we can get on horseback and ride to the Theodore yes, Roosevelt Central yes. Library. That sounds amazing. amazing. That sounds come in. incredible. Plus, you know, private sector burger. We might be a PJ laying around. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> Man is nothing if not successful, and we love to have him. Thank you for yeah. coming yeah. again. Great really to be with all of you. Thank you so much, Governor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, guys. Of course. 
an absolutely incredible interview. And I got I, I just gotta qualify one thing at the top. And Governor Burgum was just uh incredible. Um y- you know, his 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 praise for us, although I loved it, I felt was a little bit unwarranted. Like you know, he said like you know, we we gave him a platform and all of that stuff. And while I appreciate that, I feel like it's sort of an indictment on the rest of media. Yeah, yeah. dude. It it, it, like like the fact that a guy as accomplished as Doug Burgum needs us to platform him. The fact that Doug Burgum, successful tech entrepreneur, a guy who did it the right way and went back to North Dakota, made an incredibly successful company and became the governor, a guy with an incredible life story starts as a chimney sweep needed the ruthless variety program like to come is, from nothing and, it's and, crazy and it, it, the i guy's think a living legend i think what it says is like is is the sort of coastal bias in our media yes. against people like him who are incredibly successful in our country and like i i it, like i i appreciate all of his praise don't yeah. get me wrong but like the fact that that guys like that don't get to the top on their own Without some I'm help, with you, is cra- it's fucking it's crazy. crazy. That's fucking crazy. Because yeah. Doug Burgum is like a man but, who should be president someday. And, and, and talk to anyone in North Dakota of how much he's improved that state. And like you said, the guy goes to Stanford from from nothing. He goes to Stanford, and then he goes back to North Dakota. He doesn't run the playbook that everyone always is like. Okay, you know, you'll go to an Ivy, you'll go to Stanford, and then you'll get in the industry, and you, and you live in one of the big cities, and you become rich. He goes right back. And he builds his company back home and creates jobs for everyone back home. The guy's a hero. I'll be honest, guys. Like, uh, I think it's one of the virtues of the variety program in that there are some people who come on here and they know who they are Mm -hmm. that immediately get us and we get them. Mm -hmm. That was one of those guys. Burgum's a a goat. He's like... One of the best guests that we've had. Like we're and, talking and he's an incredible to person. We're talking to the same yeah. folks, right? Yeah. And and like he understood immediately that this isn't an act. What we're doing, when you see the Ruthless Variety program, we're not giving you infotainment. We're not giving you, you know, some sort of thing that we want you to hear. We're giving you the world as we see it. And that's what that guy has done since he was in poverty. Yeah. Literally. And, and dragged his nothing. family through and built this magnificent company and moved back to North Dakota, became governor and became this incredible presidential candidate. And I think he sees that component of it. And I just love that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's like a fun part to be a part of. Yeah. 100% man. Yeah. So. Anyway. Well, uh, fellas, I think we did it. I think so. Absolute banger of an episode. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much, living legend Governor Doug Burgum, and thank you so much to listeners. Remember, vote in Hack Madness on Twitter. Go to my profile. Voting's happening right now. So, until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line, and own the libs. We'll see you on Thursday. Stay ruthless.